Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So in today's video I'm going to introduce and explain three advanced rhetorical devices that I think will help you level up your close reading analysis. And this will be incredibly useful for Shakespeare, poetry, and even prose passages, because they are essentially rhetorical techniques that create special effects through language and syntax, which we see across all of literature. So if you're tired of always reaching for the same old simile, metaphor, and personification when analysing your texts, and you're looking for more sophisticated devices that will potentially set you apart from the pack, and bag you some top grades, then make sure that you watch till the very end of the video to get all the good stuff. Now let's start with the easiest one of the bunch, which isn't so easy to read, but is actually quite easy in concept, which is epithesis. Epithesis. Now it sounds intimidating, but really it's just a fancy Greek term for a very simple concept the successive repetition of a single word. Now this could come in any number, but most often appears in a string of threes in the most iconic examples, the chaz. Oh, horror, horror, horror. Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Reputation, reputation, reputation. Words, words, words. Now, like all forms of repetition, emphasis of the words and the ideas it embodies is always the point. But the effect of this emphasis could vary depending on the context. What we want to avoid when commenting on the use of a technique like epistusis is giving a trite generic statement like the repetition of the word horror emphasizes just how terrifying Macduff finds Duncan's death to be. Instead, Try and dig deeper into how this triple repetition functions together with the words that come before and after. For instance, when Macduff says, tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee, he means that the king's murder is cause for such outrage that no words suffice to describe the act. Perhaps then, this notion of language's inadequacy in portraying such a grave incident is reflected in the repetition of the word horror because Macduff is unable to move past the single word and can only as such repeat it to compensate for his failure to find other more accurate or concrete descriptions that would fully embody the extent of his outrage over the situation. Now let's use another example to illustrate, this time from Cassio in Othello, when he says, reputation, reputation, reputation. At this point in the play, the lieutenant has just been demoted by Othello for misbehaving in a drunken brawl, and he laments the loss of professional reputation that this incident has resulted in for him. As something that he desperately wants to keep but is powerless to do, Cassio can only cling onto what remains of his reputation by conjuring up again and again in its linguistic form as he rehashes the word reputation, reputation, reputation in this episusis, all the while knowing that the real thing is now beyond his reach. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now if episusis means fastening together, then anacolithin is the opposite, breaking off. It's an annoying mouthful of a word, but in one word, anacolithin means interruption. When someone switches topic mid-sentence because a random thought has just popped into their mind, that's anacolithin for you. And here are some daily examples. Hey, have you had lunch yet? I was thinking we could... Oh, wait. I have a meeting at noon. Whoops, sorry. When you have a minute later, can we please read through our essay to see if... Ah! There's a cockroach right behind you! One literary example of anacolithin that comes to mind is Iago's attempt at getting Rodrigo, his dupe, to put money in thy purse 
in exchange for supposedly helping him win Desdemona's hand. As Iago expounds on his logic for why Desdemona will not stay in love with Othello for too long, he interjects his speech with frequent appeals for Rodrigo to pay him, as we see here. It is merely a lust of the blood and a permission of the will. Come, be a man. Drown thyself. <laughs> Drown cats and blind puppies. I have professed me thy friend, and I confess me knit to thy deserving with cables of perdurable toughness. I could never better stead thee than now, or put money in thy purse. Follow thou the walls, defeat thy favour with an usurped beard. Oh, I say, put money in thy purse. It cannot be that Desdemona should long continue her love to the more. Put money in thy purse. Nor he his to her. It was a violent commencement, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration put but money in thy purse. Now, while Anna Colophon may seem to introduce tangential afterthought-like statements that are secondary to the main idea of a speech or passage, if these are repeated often enough, as in Iago's case here in the speech I just presented, then the interpolated interruption, put money in thy purse, could very well be the main point. And indeed, one could argue that Iago's primary intention at this moment is to fleece as much financial gain as he can from the gullible, helpless, and lovesick Rodrigo. So his pseudo-theorizing about why Othello and Desdemona's love must be inauthentic is really just a cover for his imperative to Rodrigo, give me your money, despite the statement being couched surreptitiously within the passage as the seeming side comments. Let's move away from Shakespeare for a while. Modernist prose also actually tends to feature quite a lot of anacolithin. A great example of this is the opening to Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, which is one of my favorite literary passages ever. In fact, I would encourage you to press pause and try to identify the interrupted sections in the excerpt that I am now about to show. Did you manage to find any? There's a parenthetical remark of, and yet for a girl of 18 as she was then, solemn, etc., which reflects that the narrator is reflecting deeply on why she had once felt such a fresh and pleasant breeze to be solemn. So she puts it down to the inexperience of youth as the sense of gravity an eight-year-old girl would have felt coming into adulthood and just finding her feet in the world. The interpolated mention of the narrator's bygone youth sets up a point in contrast with the much older, more mature version of the narrator who is speaking at this moment. Similarly, the question, was that it? Was that it? Which is interspersed between her recollections of a flirtatious exchange with an ex-lover shows just how much age has fuzzied Clarissa's memory and perhaps just how long it has been since she last thought about her past. So if Episusis is fastening together and Colophon is breaking off, then Hyperbaton is switching positions. Hyperbaton refers to the inversion of normal word order. It's an especially useful device to know when analyzing Shakespeare's plays because there's lots of syntactic inversions in his writing. Now, in order to be able to spot Hyperbaton, we must clarify a basic grammatical concept about sentence components. In the English language, any grammatical sentence must contain three elements, the subject, verb, and object. This is known as the subject, verb, object word order. So for instance, in a sentence like, Jen reads books, the subject would be Jen, the verb would be reads, and the object, books. One point to know is that the object doesn't necessarily always have to be an object, as in an item. It could be an idea which completes the sentence, as in, Jen reads on a regular basis. So in this case, the phrase on a regular basis, which is the idea, could be the object of the sentence because it completes the message of the sentence. In Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy, there are interesting examples of hyperbaton. And here's one from the very beginning of the speech. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, 
or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Instead of a normal structure which would see the line read, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and end them by opposing, the verb end is shuffled to the late part of the sentence. There are two possible ways to analyze this hyperbative. First, on a purely close reading level, to have the word end come at the end of a sentence creates an elegant synchrony between connotation and syntax. Second, the word opposing is vividly dramatized by the crisscross pattern of an inversion, with a syntactical reversal bringing to mind a swapping of opposite opposing sides. When performed and read aloud, to have the final stress fall on end is also likely to be more evocative in its effect, with the word end carrying associations of life ending, death, termination, etc., which are, of course, all core concepts in this speech as Hamlet contemplates suicide. Let's look at one final example, this time from poetry. In the second stanza of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, I Wake and Feel the Fell of Dark Not Day, which portrays a man's crisis in faith, we see a fantastic example of hyperbaton when he says, I am gall, I am heartburn. God's most deep decree bitter would have me taste. My taste was me, etc. Now try and see if you can rearrange the hyperbatonic line to its normal sentence structure. In which case it would be, God's most deep decree would have me taste bitter, bitterness in this sense. So what effect can we possibly glean from the syntactical maneuvering? Consider the pattern of inversion. It's like a cross or a twist, right? So the notion of twisting also reminds us of writhing and contortion. This syntactically projects the writhing and spiritual writhing that the speaker experiences. So perhaps it's apt for Hopkins to embed this image at the point of the speaker's emotional climax, when he's reminded of God's relentless testing of him with bitterness in his life, despite his commitment to his faith. And that's it for this video, guys. Episusis Anacolithin Hyperbaton. Three advanced but super useful rhetorical devices that you can use to level up your next essay. As a quick recap, episusis is continuous repetition, repeating a single word with no breaks in between. Anacolithin is sudden interruption, breaking off from the original sentence to bring in an interrupted thought. And hyperbaton is word order inversion, changing the normal word order of a sentence often reversing the position of subject, verb, and object to stress specific words and ideas. So if you enjoyed this video and found it useful in any way, please do hit the thumbs up button below so that YouTube will know to spread this to other like-minded, passionate, top grade lit students like yourself, and that I can carry on making these useful weekly lit videos for your studies. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification so that you don't miss out on any of my future weekly study videos for you. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.